everybody. Pete A. Turner, executive producer and host of your Break It Down show. I thought you guys would love this. Now, we've talked to Andrew Bernstein from inside, the, actually, before he went inside the NBA's playoff bubble. And, of course, you guys all know that we love DJ Severe. He has been on the guest. He's been a guest on the show any number of times. He's co-hosted. Uh, we've done work with him and Bryce Vine. So we go way back. But DJ Severe is my go-to DJ I recommend down here in Southern California. So if you guys are in the area and going to have an event, let me know. I will hook you up. DJ Severe is good. And I just thought it would be neat to talk to him because, if you don't know, he's the Dodgers stadium DJ. So he plays to a live audience probably more than anybody else in the world because the Dodgers do 4 million people a year through their stadium, plus his other Dodger live events, plus his other big events. Sometimes he fills in for this team or that team or the Monarchs or whoever it's going to be. So he is in normal times playing in front of a lot of people. But this is not normal times. And so Dodger Stadium has been empty. And... They've never really considered that before. By the way, Lacoustics, which is a, uh, I guess you could call them a large event speaker company. They put together systems, sound systems for things like Dodger Stadium. And since the Dodgers were going to host the All-Star Game in 2020, they gussied up the, the stadium and put in new pavilions and new access points and a bumping new stadium. Think about this. Back in the 80s, the Oakland A's had the best system, and it was loud. And it was great for the time. Now, <laughs> the Dodgers, because they're so good at this stuff, they're like, we know we have the best DJ. This is not just because they're proud of their DJ. It's because everybody's like, dude, the Dodgers DJ is good. Because a lot of teams don't get this. They just have them play the standard, you know, uh, I don't know, the standard playlist. DJ Severe is good at what he does. Other players, including uh, Tommy Pham from the, uh, the Padres, come up and say, dude, it's best. It's the best here. They go all over the place. Anyhow. The Dodgers go to the DJ Severe. They say, what do you need? What do you want? How do you want to do it? What are we going to buy? And so he is the guy who's going to be playing this giant speaker system, and he's helping them design what they buy. And now all year long, he's been playing with it, tuning and everything else. So there's all these cool tidbits about the COVID baseball experience that he's able to bring to us because of his unique access as a, as a Dodger employee. And really, I mean, he's not going to be on the field ever, but he is – as as a employee for the Dodgers, very few people have more direct impact with what happens during the game on the field. He's not a coach, but he creates a vibe. We talk a lot about that. So I think you guys will dig, even if you're not baseball fans, and even if you're not, like a lot of us are Giants fans, right? Because, you know, we have a lot of deep Bay Area roots. And by the way, you should all ask John to tell you his uh, San Francisco Giants funny-ass story over Twitter. Anyhow, uh, we love... We love what DJ Severe does, regardless of the team, and I think you'll find it interesting as he talks about life in the bubble as we enter into Major League Baseball playoff seasons for 2020 and the Dodgers taking the field a little later on today. All right, so here we go. Here comes DJ Severe. Lions Rock Productions. This is Jay this Moore. Is Greg Proops. This is Jordan Harbinger. This is Dexter from the Offspring. This is Nathan this is East. Sebastian Younger. This is Rick Moran. This is Stuart Copeland. This is Mick Gillette. This is Andy Summers. Hey, this is Scott Baxter. This is Gabby Reese. This is Rob Bell. Hey, this is John Leon Guerrero. Hey, and this is Pete A. Turner. What up, everybody? This is DJ Severe, and you're chilling in with the Break It Down Show. Yes, indeed. So first off, before we do anything else, I just want to cover it. I love you, man. I just, I love that we get to do this. I love that we got to get yes. to know each other. I mean, look, we both like to love the Dodgers, but you yeah. know, there's something more like when we just, you light me up when I think about getting to hang out with you and talking to you and all that stuff. And, and nobody gets to hear that kind of stuff in us. So I just, I think the world of you and what you do and, and uh, you're making the world a better place. Thank you, bro. I appreciate you as well. We come together on some, some <laughs> on some great things and like minds. So it's always a pleasure. Yeah, yeah. Especially like in, in, in our time right now, it's so easy to be divided on everything. And here we are allowing so many things to unite, you know, us right. in general, our community, you know, like how do we help right. one another? How do we support one another? And I, I guess the big thing to say right now is, so you're the, the Los Angeles Dodgers official DJ in the stadium, the, what I like to say, the most listened to live DJ in the world. Um, although this year, you know, a little knock on the numbers. <laughs> 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. I got cardboard cutouts, so I had to count the cardboard cutouts, and then that's my number this year. Yeah, yeah. I, I thought it would be really cool to talk to you about what it is that you do, like, and how you do it now. I mean, your job. So, I mean, the DJ. One thing, could we all get that? You play music, but you have fifty thousand plus people on an average night who are trying to 
have a great time at a baseball game and you use music to get them to on your portion of it. But now they're not there. What's it been like DJing baseball games during COVID? So it went through stages. I think we kind of talked about this in the beginning, like before we even kicked off what it was going to be like. So it went through a couple stages. The first stage was me trying to prepare for what I normally do, then pumping my brakes to say, well, don't prepare that way. Just kind of get a blueprint of what you normally do. Yeah. And then be prepared to pivot with what comes. Because in talking to different management who had no idea, first of all, really what I do and then what their idea was, um, trying to figure out then from there. And then, so I backed up a little bit and I just took it from the perspective of what I do that I know works. And then I started communicating with the players to see what their insight was going to be. Then I wanted to see what the setup was going to be. And then we, we threw in this whole crowd noise element, which none of us knew was um, right. going to come around. Um, and so then it's kind of like it unfolded. Every day was different. So we came in and you're like, okay, well, this is different. This is different. And a couple of managers would tell me, well, you're just going to really just be enjoying baseball and kind of play for the fan, try to kind of just play for the players now. And so I took that approach first and I just started doing what I normally work for the players. I started watching their reaction, their normal reaction. And from the first time I went in, the first three games they had, there was just um, the sound guy was just playing music in the background. And then the last game, when it was really prepared, they brought in me and Dieter, the organist. And just to hear them ask, the reporters, Alana Rizzo asked Dave, what was it like to have DJ Severe back in the house? He said it was great. The energy was up. He said he always brings it when it comes. So that gave me a little more energy going towards it. I'm like, okay that now I know they really need me and it resonates to them when I'm here and there's a difference. So because I always look down when I'm playing music and I always see Doc bobbing his head, which is really cool for me to see like the a, a major league manager whom I know and whom I have discussions with, but I haven't been able to talk to since spring training because this whole COVID thing here. So we're pretty much hands off. So right. that's another thing that I'm um, usually, I can go down and talk to them anytime I want. I've been hands off this whole time. Um, I run into Cody at the stoplight three times, ironically, at the end of the night. And we've talked about different songs and how they work from car to car, just at a stoplight. So that's been cool. I've, I've text message with like some of the players who text me, like AJ Pollock and Rios, who's new, who I've developed relationships. So it's different now that the relationships I'm developing with them via text messages and like DMs that they send me. Um, I even had Tommy Pham of the Padres come in and DM me and tell me, you're the, the best ML DJ of any. And he's like, I fuck with you like so good. Like you're the like the best. So yeah. From him to for him to come in right right away, kind of like solidified and it gave me like a, a cool stance that I was like, okay, now let me go in. So now I just kind of let it unfold. And I realized that I had even more of a format now because now my inning break sometimes is just me. So now I can really DJ where it's like there's no video beforehand. It's just me with two minutes to play two songs. So I started saying, okay, I'm gonna play the sample, I'm gonna play the original, then I'm gonna play the what the sample came. And it really put more of a spotlight on me, so to speak, as far as people listening, because I'm getting all kind of comments because I, I was prepared to come in this year with so many more tracks that I had discovered that I got this new sound system yeah. that no one no one of the fans heard, but it's just knocking. And so oh, it's like, I, can't um, I just, I had this open canvas to kind of work with. It's almost like a pre-rehearsal till ne to next year. You know what I mean? Like, and what I can really like do, but to just get this, the stamp of approval from the players and the energy there and hear them talk about it. And then like, even when they send me text messages, like, man, keep doing what you're doing. We loving it. Um, so, I mean, that was my first kind of like um, feel into it. And it took me probably one, two home stands and I was right back to regular form. So it sounds like, and, we, and from seeing the operation live when we were up there with you, uh, that one time we recorded there, you've got a lot more work to do in terms of, do you have to have more songs on hand? You've got more time to fill because there's not, 
you know, T-shirt cannons and all that kind of stuff. Right. Right. Um, there's a little more, but not that much more. The only, the only difference is now is more management around with nothing to do because there's no in-game entertainment. There's just me, the organ player, and whatever the team is throwing up on the, throwing out on the field. So we'll run a video. We still run pump videos every now and then, but for the most part, there's no anthem singer, so it starts off. Dieter plays the anthem on the organ. We go right into the game. There's no pregame ceremonies. There's no Tommy Lasorda walking around. There's no nothing. This is an empty stadium. You come in, get your temperature check, answer your questions, use whatever bathroom you can use because it's all separate. We all can only go in certain areas now. We're tiered. Tier one, tier two, tier three employees right. by MLB. It's a whole different security thing. So, and then now you've seen the setup. My, we're social distancing. So the only people in my booth now are me and the sound guy. Dieter, we're already separate. But now my producer and Todd are in the next room over from us. So we're more kind of hand gesturing and depending on our own rhythm to get things kind of like done. Although we still have headsets, but I usually I usually try to listen to my own um, headsets when I'm doing it, and I like to go off of my my producer who's normally sitting right next to me. We don't even have scripts this year because we're not there's not a bunch of people to, in the production, so we're just kind of like we get a blueprint of what goes on. That's pretty much it. The lineups aren't coming out like normal because there's no media. There's only like three or four media. They're a level below us. Um, are now there's no visiting. Uh, meet, no, no visiting meeting, no visiting announcers. They're all doing it from their studio back home. So it's really a bare bones kind of like thing. But I like it because like the other day I tweeted out, I was walking in and me and Oral Hershiser were just having a conversation about his broadcast like the other day. I'm getting a more hands-on time with him. My script for me is more of a, um, like a, uh, a safety net. I just need to see what, at the top, what it is that day. And then the rest I'll fill in the blanks. I don't really need to follow it along, but it kind of gives me an idea of what the days until I kind of flip through it, flip through it, flip through it, and then I'm, I'm kind of like done with it. Cause then I just kind of rely on my own rhythm after that. But just not having that, that's just an extra kind of like, okay, well, this is brand new and something I'm not used to, you know what I mean? Yeah. So it took a minute to get used to that. Cause now you're looking for the, um, your 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 producer to come through and be like, hey, this is what we're doing today, but it's none of that. So it's kind of like you're on your own. Uh, I wanted to tell the fun story. I don't know if everybody's heard it or not yet, but uh, my girlfriend decided to have a big, huge bash in her backyard, and uh, we hired you as the DJ. And yeah. this is how good of a DJ DJ Severe is. So so we have this. We have my buddy Paul making paella, which was incredible. Probably had about a hundred people in and out of the place. And we got our first noise warning at like nine o'clock or something. And it wasn't like DJ right. Severe was going crazy. He was like backyard appropriate and everything. But the cops came and just said, you know, someone complained. You guys got to just take it easy. No problem. No worries. And then, uh, but as they were walking up, they were like, they were bobbing their heads. <laughs> <laughs> and then when they came back around like 10, 15 or whatever, this is my girlfriend and how like how she is. She's like, I'm only turning 50 once. This is my bash. Um, so what's the ticket going to cost? Cause we're just going to keep going. <laughs> and they're right, like, right, 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 Oh no, right, it's right. not about that. We love it. The music is great. You guys are doing a great job, but you know, just, just, uh, you had the vibe going even from the moment the cops came out of the car, you know, you had them bobbing their heads. Yeah, that, I love that. I love that. I know. I love that story. I can't tell it enough, but when you, when you see doc, you know, and he's, he's probably not even aware he's doing it. Right. But you're aware he's doing it. I would guess. Like, cause he's in game thinking about things, you know? Right. Right. Um, say that again, Pete. I was just saying doc, when doc's bobbing his head during the game, yeah. I imagine he's working so hard mentally. He probably doesn't realize that he's doing it, but you're watching him. Right. And you know, he's doing right. it. So, you know, you're being, you're doing your job well. Right. And it's, it's usually at, so it's usually, it's funny because I've seen so many more of the pitching coach of the, of the, of like the pitching coach. And then the other coaches like um, Lombard, we talk about the music all the time in spring chain, but now just to see it, the other coaches like in pregame clapping the hands and like getting pumped up with the team as well, because sometimes there's a disconnect between the older coaches and the younger players, mm -hmm. but they all kind of get together and vibe 
in the pregame. And then just to see them kind of like snapping their finger or like, you know, when you tapping their foot, you know, it's, it, it, it's really interesting. The most time I, I catch like Doc, it'll be like in an inning break because I have a, a thing where I always try to play like a 70s classic, like an 80s classic. I try to mix in at least two to three like per game. And I always see him. I try to pick these ones. I'm going to try to look down and see if I can see Doc like bobbing his head. And so lots of times there's nobody else around him and he's just kind of leaned over and I can see his head moving. And he's not trying to hide it at all. Like, I don't want the camera to see me. He's going like full force into it. Um, another thing I do this this season, which I've done before too, is I always try to check out the visiting team when they come in, uh-huh. especially the te- teams that have never been here. And I can usually catch at least two to three um, players like dancing a little bit or like, you know what I mean, really beaten like on, on the stand just to kind of get that input, especially in pregame when I know there's certain Latin players and there's certain songs that I can play. I like to try to see, kind of get them moving. I mean, because to me, I like the whole aspect of everyone coming in and enjoying themselves when they come to the stadium. Yeah. You know what I mean? That's yeah. a big, because to hear players talk about the music here on other teams, you know what I mean? And people get into it, but don't pump them up. I'm like, man, look, you see these guys talking to each other. They're friends. It's, 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 not even a, it's not even about that. And then I'm, I try to be good at what I'm doing. So I'm not trying to dumb down the music. I'm still going to play good music regardless of who comes, who comes to town. I want to try to signify if, like, an Atlanta comes in. I'll play some Atlanta. You know what I mean? I try to, like, yeah. um, signify the moment with what I do. That's what I do. Yeah, you definitely do. And, and Todd's asking, do you work with players in the walk-up music? I, I, you, I mean, I'll answer that for you. Yes. <laughs> they, yes. They text you all the time. How often are they messing yeah. with that, though? Like, you know, are they, are they trying to use it to get out of a slump? Are they trying to change their vibe? Do they do it in-game? It's been different this year. Um, like, me and JT, he doesn't mess with his a lot because JT, me and JT talked about this a couple years ago. He's like, look, man, whatever song I have, if I'm slumping that night or if I'm not having a bad night, he's like, I'm going to look up and give you, a, like, a, a head nod or you know when to switch to some of my other stuff that that works. So me and JT kind of have that. Um, like I said, me and Cody, in the beginning of the season, he was working on trying to get out of his song is um, Hotel California. Right. And he was like, man, I want to add another song, but I haven't, like, figured out. I'm, I'm, I'm waiting. I'm, I'm checking out this Pop Smoke album. And I'm going to see what I got. So I'm like, okay. And then it's funny because he picked the Drake song, the new one. Um, and so it's been such a good song that a couple of times I was able to play it longer. And it kind of like, like it just, the inning breaks have worked out where he's been coming up and we've been getting out of a video. So I've been able to like lead into it longer. Mm-hmm. And then we actually had a conversation about that. One of the conversations was when we were at the stoplight together, he's like, man, I love it when, my, he's like, I'm loving my new track, and I like. I said, I, I know, I love it when I can play it long. He said, Yeah, that's the best when we get to play it like, like longer, like that. I mean, so, and then even on a personal note, like when Pollock was, AJ Pollock has been one of my favorite players since he, since he got here, and he's he's um, it's different because I never gave him my number, but he actually sought out to get my number. Him, Austin Barnes, Joe Kelly, they actually asked other players who have my number to give. So every now and then I get a random like text message, but. AJ, I like, I really like AJ because we we have like great conversations. And he struggled his first year here, but I was I knew AJ would be such a good player. So like in, even in between him struggling, I would send him like cool little text messages like, man, keep balling, keep balling. And he would send me a text message back, like, man, thanks. It means a lot that you that you like do this for me. He's like, this makes me feel good. So just to have developed that kind of relationship, even though we're distant from COVID, but just to be able to send them like, like a message to keep them going. Even like Edwin Wheels when he was hurt. A couple of weeks ago, I was like, man, don't worry. Um, heal up because we need you. He's like, man, thanks. That's so like that's so great to hear. You know what I mean? And so um, just to see these players follow me, like some of my different things, you know what I mean? It's yep. it's such a different atmosphere now. And it's actually crossed over from music to, to like more on a personal note with some. You know what I mean? Yeah. Even with Mookie, I've done two events with his foundation. And I have... Other than meeting him in spring training, it's like I'm developing a relationship with this foundation through him, but kind of like through what I do with the foundation. And then also I did six events for Yasiel Pui this summer, who this who's not even on the team anymore. But right. I have a I have a great partnership with his with his um with his um his team now. And it's actually better than when he was on the team because he'll he he follows my <laughs> my Instagram, he likes some stuff, you know what I mean? He sent me signed stuff. So it's like it's a trip 
the the relationship I have now that's come branched out of this COVID thing and then just giving back with, through the foundation. Yeah, that's the – I want to ask, too, about like um, someone like Edwin Rios. And for those that don't know the Dodgers, he's he's been a prospect for a long time. But the Dodgers right. have been so good, it's been hard for him right. to crack in. There's never been any doubt about his major league power. This guy right. touches the ball. It goes out. It, it's really it neat to out. see him play. Are you are you thinking about these guys? Like, are you ready? Like, when, when um, Zach McKinstry gets his call up, are you ready for that? Or do you have to scramble to figure out what you're going to do for him or what he wants? You know, it's different with, with um, the players because even trying to get ready for them and figure them out. A lot of people try to, like, when a new player is coming up, people start sending me suggestions, and he should be there, especially if he has a, a certain nickname, like Will Smith. You know what I mean? People yeah. start sending you all that get jiggy with it and this, that, and other. And it's almost like, well, I never like to put anything on anybody because I don't know what you like. You yeah. know what I mean? It's like most of the young players – be it white, black, or whatever, they love hip hop, and then some don't, you know what I mean? Yeah, like very few don't. Like, even I know for a fact, Corey Seeger, he's never doing anything but country music, but he always sends me when he sends me his tracks, he's like, Turn it up like hip hop, and I always go, Corey, it's not hip hop, I can't turn it, I'm gonna turn it up, but it's not, it's not gonna sound like hip hop. <laughs> but I always like to, if if a player comes up, I'll just do a, a blanket bed for them until they figure it out, because even behind the Will Smith thing. Everybody was like, do this, do that, do that. So the first time I saw Will Smith, I asked him, I said, do you have a song? And he was like, nope. And you could tell he didn't care, like, what his song was going to be. He hadn't, that's not what he was, he was even concerned about. So I talked to him before he made his debut, and I'm thinking, okay, and everybody's asking me, did he go with this? I'm like, nope, he didn't go with anything. But five minutes before the game, PR said, nope, he's going with Fresh Prince of Bel-Air theme. And I later on found out, that Russell Martin at the time told him, no, this is going to be your song. So it's oh. kind of like a rookie, yeah. like rookie, like kind of like <laughs> deal. He had to take it. Yeah. And so now he's stuck with that song because for one, he doesn't care. But then I even asked him at the foundation party. I was like, do you like that song? He's like, man, he kind of like shrugged his shoulders. Like, what can I do? Because at the time, Russell Martin was still on the team. Yeah. I'm hoping maybe he'll graduate to something else. But if, if you stick something on like the Will Smith thing, then that's kind of what gets like stuck with you. Right. And then there's other players who don't care. Like um, Chris Taylor doesn't care. I sat down with, I was at a, in spring training talking to Chris Taylor and Keith Hernandez and Cody Bellinger and, and Muncie. We were all sitting right there because a, a reporter wanted me to ask Taylor why he picked the song Copperhead Road because he's from Virginia or Maryland. And I guess that's where Copperhead Road is. Okay. And so he's telling us a story. So there's, <laughs> there's Taylor, Chris Taylor, uh, Cody Bellinger, uh, I think Jock might have been there too, and Muncy. So we're sitting there, like everybody's waiting to anticipate for like this big story. And Chris just goes, Well, one day one of my friends was coming to town and I just picked that song and it kind of like stuck. And everybody's just looking at him like, That's the story behind that song. That's where you stick with it. So Chris, Chris Taylor doesn't care whatsoever what the song is. But I mean, those are still his songs. He doesn't change. He probably will never change. Yeah. So it's the difference between someone that really cares and not like me and Matt Kemp used to sit at his locker room for like 20, 30 minutes in spring training. He'd be playing me song after song after song. Same thing with Andre Ethier, where he really would, they really were into it. Some people aren't into it. Some people are not. And then like Jock, I think Jock lets his wife pick his songs. So there's a different flow with like kind of everybody. But once you learn the rhythm, that's why people are like, well, you should play this for him. Like, I, it's hard for me to tell people like, look, I don't pick songs for them. I let them, pick the songs because far be it for me to do something or tell them something about a song it's like when justin turner you text me sometime in the middle of the night is this song good like if say is this a banger or not i'll never tell him no i'll just tell him yeah i mean because why would i tell you no do i have a backup or what if you really like this song or this song means something to you i don't want to tell you that it's not going to work right you know what i mean i'm just going to do what you ask me to do you know or what you think you know what i mean because obviously something led you like to that even Edwin Rios he he changed the song just uh two days ago he sent me a DM and he hit a home run he hit a home run last night so I mean you know like that's perfect timing for them they probably attach a lot a lot more into that he probably would have hit the home run if he had the same song but I mean that's that sometimes that's a, a, a game changer Jock is the one who switches up a lot I can tell when Jock is struggling 
because he's throwing a couple of F-bombs like this season where it's like it got kind of out because there's no crowd in there. <laughs> and then that's when Jock usually switches up. But Jock is funny because Jock will go back to other previous songs. That's why I never get rid of anybody's song. Mm -hmm. He'll go back and he'll dance around different things. Very rarely does he come with something new. How much behind the scenes work do you have to do? I mean, I know that there's been some controversy, not that you did this wrong, but about like what words were slipping through on songs. You've got to clean things up and everything. Are you are you always listening to what's coming out right now? Yeah. Or how much time does that take for you too? Because that I mean, that is work that you have to do when you're not at the stadium to be to be ready, to know what it is, to know what's in it, to know what the words are, right. to know what I don't know. I mean, and what about someone like um uh Tech Nine, you know, and, and his his music, I mean, given the fact that he went to jail for having sex with right. middle school age girls, can you even touch right. that stuff? I can. I um Hey, this is P.A. Turner from Lions Rock Productions. We create podcasts around here. And if you, your brand, or your company want to figure out how to do a podcast, just talk to me. I'll give you the advice on the right gear, the best plan, and show you how to take a podcast that makes sense for you, that's sustainable, that's scalable, and fun. Hit me up at Pete at BreakItDownShow.com. Let me help. I want to hear about it. I can. I, um, I'll say I'm... I'm kind of good at knowing how to walk a fine line with the stuff that I play. I know where I can, where I can go and where I can't go. I think the only thing that changed um, with like management when it first happened was the Michael Jackson scandal. And then everybody was so scared. Like we're staying away from Michael Jackson period, which I would have done anyway. Now, slowly but surely I'm creeping it kind of like back in on some different things, but I'm not going to make it a whole staple of, like what I'm doing, I'm constantly. It's funny, my mind, how my mind works. It's almost like I'm I'm not allowed to just listen to music anymore for the sake of listening to music because I'm always listening to see yep. whether I can use it in the stadium or not. So even TV commercials, or if I go to the movies, when you can go to the movies, I'm always examining like, okay, <laughs> I, that I can use I can use this song into what I do, and that's actually part of my formula. My formula in making my especially my pregame mixes when you walk into the stadium is not playing what you heard on the radio because I don't want you to get out of your car and come right in the stadium and hear the same thing. So I try to be seasons ahead with my music. So I spend a lot of time in the off season creating a bunch of playlists and mixes with music that are in my record pools that I found. And also when I hear songs on like, I'm a big, this is one of my secrets. I steal a lot of music from like, Target commercials, Apple Apple product yeah. commercials, stuff like that. Because when you come in and you hear it in the stadium, it makes you think you knew the song, but you don't know where you heard it. So it's kind of like you recognize it and you like it. Because anytime they put it in a commercial, it's, it's probably more likely it's been tested and it's going to like work. So I steal a lot of music from like commercials. If I can't, I'm always examining at the TV um, trying to get the song that I can use in my mix. So that way I'm, I try to be, I try to be months ahead before you even know what song it is. So that's kind of like my formula, especially I'm always pouring through my record pools um, to find something that is um, playable and that works for me at the stadium. Cause I have a formula. I don't do a lot of the EDM that has to rise up and then the fist pump. I like a good, strong house beat with some nice horns, some yeah. good vocals, not, and then kind of more repetitive stuff because I try to stay away from a lot of the lyrics on different things because that's where you kind of get in trouble if someone hears something and they want to write something. My hip hop um, my, the, is really played for batting practice in the team when no fans are in the stadium because that's the hip hop that they like want to hear. So you can be a little more controversial. But as soon as we hit gates, that's when I switch to more fan friendly type stuff with more hip hop that works and then the type of things that um, I want to do because really. And truly, I like to look out and see every person from a kid to an older person, white, black, Latin American, Asian, doesn't matter. But if I can see people, different people bobbing their heads at different times, that's what I do it for. So I try to find like different things and different elements that encompass everybody and bring everybody in, which is more and more I'm hearing from people that I'm the best DJ in MLB and like just the the props I get on Twitter on a daily basis from people um, who are discovering me. You know what I mean? It's, it's really nice to get that feedback. 
Yeah, I mean, Tommy Pham saying that, you get it a lot. I mean, back when we first met years ago now, uh, you were hearing the same thing. What right. I mean, there are other good DJs out there. What do you think? Right. Do you have a sense for why, I mean, a visiting player would say it's the best here? Any idea? I think it's my formula. You know what? It has a lot to do with the sound system, but also a lot to do with the formula. I think that probably a majority of other ballparks don't really have DJ DJs who get a chance to go out and use the music in other formats. Like most people who do their job, this is all they do. And then some organizations get caught up in such a repetitive um, song motion and they just accept that. It also depends on the management up above to let you walk out there. They might be putting some constraints because yeah. people are a little, might, might be a little bit scared of the music. But I mean, with us being in LA, I'm lucky enough to have a um, um, management that kind of like lets me get out there. And then, I mean, I know what, you, what each of my each of my bosses like, so I kind of do enough of that to keep them off my yeah. off my radar. Yeah. Um, and then everything else, as long as they see the people bobbing their heads, and I get a lot of feedback from the cameraman because you also got to remember I'm working for the for the cameraman too because they have to get shots of people dancing. Every cameraman that comes in tell me, man, you make my job so much easier oh, with the good. music you play yeah. because because it's not hard for me to find somebody enjoying the music that you that you play. So many more stadiums get caught up on the classic rock, which is fine. Yeah. But you gotta remember, um, a lot of people say, Well, you should play more classic rock. And I tell them, like, look, why would I play like more classic rock? I say, I, I'm not knocking it, but the those are kids down there that are playing. They don't want to hear that. Yeah. And then I'm just going to sound, you want me to sound like every other stadium that around that just, it's kind of like takes the low hanging fruit. Like, you know what I mean? Like I love Van Halen, but I haven't played Van Halen in years and not <laughs> planning on playing Van Halen. You know what I mean? Like yeah. it's just, it's, you get it. That's a different time and space that you go to. And that's another reason why I don't put any dated songs like that in any of my pregame mixes. Most of the week I play mixes that are already made. Number mm -hmm. one, I know the edits are good. It's hard for me to go in and try to mix live every game because as soon as I try to go in and mix live, that's when somebody's going to need me to do something or a player's going to need to talk to me. So then, then I'm um um I'm reduced to like a playlist. So it's like I like to have at least seven to ten mixes done before I even go in that are not going to sound dated. That have at least a two year lifetime. Yeah. And so, um, I always tell people I never put any old school in my mixes because as soon as I put an old school song in that mix. And you hear that mix two times, you're going to say that DJ's playing the same old stuff because it's so recognizable because you've heard it for years and years and years and years. Yeah. Now, what I will do is do a mix dedicated to that, and I'll play it every other homestand. Like, I have a Yacht Rock mix I do. I have an 80s pop mix that I do. Right. But it consists of all that stuff so that when you hear it, you hear it all together, and it encompasses everything you want to hear. And so you know, okay, that's Severe's 80s mix. And then that resonates with you. I have a morning time mix, which is more of my Yacht Rock type stuff that I use for Sundays. So if people really tap in, they'll understand my flow and what I do on a on a game-to-game -game basis. The uh, Todd was asking about crowd noise. And I know at first it, it wasn't a thing for all the ballparks. When did you guys start doing it? And then who does the actual crowd noise? Okay, so that's a big... <laughs> um, um, so... At first, MLB, I can't think of the company. There was a company that was selling a crowd noise system to every MLB team. So you had the option of doing it yourself or taking on the system from MLB. Right. So um, my boss, Tom Darren, who's head of Dodger Vision, Went in, got some looped crowd noise from some previous games. Um, we installed some um, a different sound system on the field level, so it kind of like um, projects out, like it's coming from the fans. Yeah. He developed this loop, and I have a friend who works with me, Jessica. She's actually used to be a stage manager, so she runs it. So she has like an instant replay and an iPad with these different tracks that you that you play. Now that in and of itself has been a kind of like a, a management type thing because some of the players didn't like it. I can't say who didn't like it and wanted it down or up, but 
that was a, a total kind of like vibe too. At first it was a like a, a, a big headache for people and people were trying to figure out how to like do it. I was even calling around to different like sound guys I know at different stadiums to see how they do, you know what I mean? Because it's, it, it, it was sounding different. We finally got it fine tuned because fine tuned because Tom did such a great job of like doing the homework and then like teaching Jessica. But it wasn't something that you could just walk in and do. This is something that's right. never needed to be done <laughs> yeah. and had to be created. You know what I mean? Yeah. And then of course everybody and their mom has an opinion about it because they think that they know what to do. But how do you know what to do on something that's never been like done before? So I mean, it's always been a work in progress. I think we kind of like fine tune it because every now and then somebody will tweet to me great job on the crowd noise. I'm like, well, that's not me. That's Tom Darren and that's Jessica um, and Runner are doing it. So I try to give people their credit for, you know, what they're doing. But shouts out to Tom because he created a perfect system like for us at the stadium. And then what about like those standard sound things that you hear when you watch the game? Like if there's an instant replay challenge, you know, like they're, they'll play, I don't know. And you, I don't think you do this, but the Jeopardy theme will play or there'll be some kind of funny joke in the uh, replay is that you or is that somebody else yeah well okay so for me so i have challenge songs i have a challenge playlist so in my challenge playlist i love it i try to always be i always try to be uh music um i always try to i always gonna try to take you back to music perspective so i don't try to do i try to stay away from the the sort of jokey type stuff so on my playlist and i do these depending on who's um challenging so I, I'll do Minute by Minute by the Doobie Brothers. That's one of my favorites. I'll do um, Time by Boy George. I do Private Eyes by Hall & Oates. I do Is There Something I Should Know by Duran Duran. I do She Blinded Me with Science. If it's a clear call, I'll sneak that one in because I don't want the, the umpires to get kind of pissed off at me. So I kind of sneak that one in. Yeah. Um, I do Time After Time by Cindy Lauper. If it's, if it's on the other team, I'll do I Wish by Ski Low. I'll do Faking the Funk by like Main Source. Um, I'll do pop music. So I try to still make you think about music. And I love it when the fans like pick up on what I'm doing and they send me like a tweet, like how classic it was for me to play. And I'm constantly thinking of songs um, to do that. You know, I never try to be low hanging fruit. When the Astros came yeah. to town, everybody, everybody sent us every cheating song this. And we're like, look, First off, we're the professionals, like, let us do it. I wouldn't even want to make you think, think, not take. Anybody can go to, I could come up with every song that says cheating, you know, in it and do it. But we want to make you think a little bit more into why we play a song. You know what I mean? So that's what we did when the Astros came to town. Because everybody said, well, you should have played this and you should have played that. And I'm like, yeah, but that's kind of like easy to play. Look at what I did play. Yeah. And then you got to explain to them. I'm still playing music for a baseball game. I can't make it so slow and it's like dumbed down where the energy just draws just for the sake of playing this the song out. So I still want to do it in the same vein of the energy I'm trying to produce for the players as well as make you think musically. That's what I want to do. Yeah, Careless Whispers doesn't get people going crazy in the stadium even though you play no, <laughs> like no. a song about no. cheating or whatever. No, no. <laughs> That's hilarious. Uh, okay, so I wanted to ask you another thing, too, about um, all of this. So Jock will drop an F-bomb, and a lot of guys do, but he's been a little bit notorious for that. Do they turn right. the crowd noise up to kind of cover him when he, you know, grounds into the double play or whatever? No, because okay. it is – got to remember, it's on a loop, so it's even kind of hard to – hit that point. So the F bombs, if they go, they just gotta go. And it's, and then, you know, it varies from 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 T V truck to T V truck. Some people have um a lot more mics and want that crowd noise. Like ESPN comes in here, you can hear every pop, every click. So it's kinda like on them yeah. um how um loud it is over broadcast. Right. But even for us to hear it from like up high, that's when you know it was kinda like you know what I mean? Yeah. There's nobody in the stands, yeah. which I'm sure he was doing it. I'm sure he was doing it before. You know what I mean? So, I mean, f bomb, f bomb. I guess. Yeah, you know? I, I do like how um, when when they do do it, how much more miking of the players is going on. And I I think right. it would be cool to have miking of the DJ as well, not to give you more work to do, but you know that one inning or whatever when you're talking about. I I think right. it's neat to share that. You know, I mean, obviously Oral and and Joe are already miked, but. 
the rest of you all who have things to say, you know, I, th I think it would be cool right. to hear that. Right. I think that's a work in progress because as Dieter and I get our recognition, I think it's going to become something like that because we do get a lot more recognition, probably more recognition than any duo in MLB for what we do. I mean, because Oral talks, Oral and, and, and Joe, they talk about Dieter night in, night out. They add me. Like last night we had an incident where the, uh, we had a crowd delay um because one of the fire alarms went off so we had our beacons right. our home run beacons were flashing and so i played flashing lights and so they'll give me my shout out and my and my props on that so um i think as the spotlight grows on us we'll it'll become more of a right now i think we're more uh uh team and kind of like cult favorites you know what i mean yeah. because um but it'll if it keeps on resonating and as, if the team keeps succeeding um, I think it'll be probably a, a point of a uh, story for other people that if it really gets on their radar, yeah. you know? Yeah. I mean, you, you, and Dieter also, like you don't have to ask who Dieter is without even knowing who he is. You're like, right. Oh, that must be Dieter. Like he just, he stands right. out. Right. Uh, the other right. thing I wanted to ask you about with all of this stuff with the COVID and everything, how worried are you about your well being or in general, anybody else? Like you're like, God, someone's going to get it. And it's just going to go like wildfire through this place. You know, it's funny because when it first started, I was kind of concerned, like even when it hit, like I haven't been, um, other than a little bit of quarantine everybody went to, like even my daytime job, I'm an essential worker, so I've been out. Uh -huh. And once it started, um, we get tested every week. Like, so even if there's not a game, we get tested. Like I got tested this week. I've taken my, I'm scheduled to take my 10th COVID test um, at the stadium on Monday. Right. And this is to get prepared for like, um, playoffs. Yeah. The only thing. Okay. So right now, since the season ends tomorrow. And so we have our wild card series at the stadium and then the Amer the ALDS. So I have to work the ALDS games because now we're going into these perspective, perspective bubbles, respective bubbles. Dodgers are going to Texas and then the American League is coming here. So I have to work those games, which is a total different type of thing for me. Um, safety wise, I'm not sure what they're, they're bringing in, but I mean, I'm hands off. So I'm not really concerned with it at all. Like, cause I've been kind of like pretty consistent. Thank God where I've been tested. I've been around people. I've been around the same consistent people. Um, but I'm interested because my management, they kind of tell me like, look, we don't know what's going to happen World Series wise. I know that they're they're trying if we make it to get me to be able to go um, so that it's more of a home field advantage. But I'm not sure if it's going to be able to happen. That's the only thing I'm concerned because if they do allow me to go, obviously I have to fit into some kind of bubble and some kind of quarantine type of thing where I know our some of our team that some of our um, Dodger division that are going to go, they have to start their quarantine process a couple of days. So that means going to Texas and being in the hotel room right. until the World Series. So yeah. um, I'm not – that's going to be like totally different thing. I'm, I'm, I'm hoping I get to go. I'm, first of all, I'm hoping we get to make the, the World Series, first off, because yeah. it's, it's all a moot point. It's all a moot point if, if we don't even get there. But I'm hoping I get to go. Um, because it would also, I mean, it's also it's kind of bittersweet that if we make it to the World Series and I'm not there, like like spinning the music, I'm be like really kind of like disappointed. Um, yeah. and and someone else time, is playing for your team. I mean, you're really yeah. a teammate. I mean, not yeah. every person that works for the Dodgers is a teammate, but you really are in that very specific team circle. At least in, in terms of how I see it, you know. Yeah, yeah, and I actually got a compliment. From my from my producer this week, he said, "Man, I was in the meeting with them, and management, upper management, said like, look, it's not really a real home field advantage if you don't send our DJ.' And so they're pushing, they're really pushing, you know, for me to be able to like go. And like you said, other MLB teams probably don't see that because they they do such a probably just kind of like they just kind of like mail it in. Like we we really take it seriously because we're LA and that's a big part of the culture here. And then." Maybe that's what's lacking with like some of the other things. They don't really put um, a, like a, a real consistent energy towards making your music part of the entertainment too. Like I said, 
we're we're to me we're years above our time, and yeah. then people are gonna catch up like later on because lots of times it takes you know what I mean the the, the people that figure out that there is an actual DJ. You know what I mean? That must be real in tune to music. Most people come there for the baseball, so that's what everybody thinks. We're just going to market towards the baseball. Yeah. But there's this other thing that's in the background that makes it so much better. I've had so many people tell me, man, I just enjoy coming to the games now because like, of the music. Whether we win or lose, it's, it's like an a, a cheat. Or even if we do lose, it's like we still had a good time. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like partying with you. That's one of the best things for me, to, to, to walk out at the end of the night and – see the people that don't know I'm the DJ and they're talking about the music or they're still dancing or even I'm walking and then people go, oh, that's DJ Severe. And then they say, they'll stop me and take a picture. And then everybody's like asking, well, who's that? And then they tell them and then they, then I'm into another like conversation. So, I mean, that's one of the real big treats, just kind of like watching the atmosphere, even if we lose and still see people's like spirits up or just dancing, you know what I mean? Singing yeah. a song, singing some of the songs I play or like the recognition I always know I can tell how my Twitter is going to grow. My Twitter grows about 300 people per homestand from some different things I do. And I kind of like watch it because I'm even interactive with the fans during the game. You know what I mean? I try to keep them in tune with, what I'm, with yeah. what I'm doing. I try to be as hands on as possible and try to give them my outside look. Like that's another thing I've done since we've been in this. Like I'll go live for the pregame to let people hear the announcements and then they say, thank you so much because I miss being there for this. You know what I mean? So I will i don't do it all the time. I'll do like the seventh inning stretch. Or if I do something significant, I'll take a video of it and, and send it out. And it's actually done a lot for people who can't come to the stadium and they say thank you. A lot of people say yeah. thank you for doing that because I really miss being there. Yeah, So Makes sense. Um, I've been trying to figure out different ways to do to kind of give them the same experience. Is there a better live gig that you've ever had than World Series games? Is there like what compares with that? You know what? Nothing really. Um, the, the simple bittersweet fact that we lost both World Series. But I mean, uh, I'm a sports fan first. And then to me, I've always said, like, of all the playoffs or any sport, baseball playoffs is the best playoffs to me. Because to hear, like, first off, the tenseness of a crowd, say you're, you're home, and you need a critical hit. You got someone in scoring position to either get you back in the game, take yeah. the lead of the game. But the the that that crack in the bat, and you know it's a base hit, especially if it's a base hit, to hear the crowd, the way the crowd for MLB swells for that, and then you can to play the music and to see that reaction, there's nothing like that. And I was blessed enough to do two World Series even though we lost, but it was bittersweet because at the end of both of them, they beat us on our field. And I had to play music for the, um, the, the other team, which was like so bittersweet like, uh, to me. But I mean, I had to do it because like, at that point, you don't work for just the Dodgers, you work for MLB. So Didn't you go to Jackie Robinson High School too or something like that? Yeah, I went to John Muir High School, which is uh, it's Jackie kind of Robinson. tear your heart apart, you know, to have to. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. So the bubble thing is interesting. So if you are here, you're going to be working the American League games, and then do they just say, do like, do the players just text each other like, "Hey, make sure you text DJ Severe what you need; he'll hook you up." I don't know. That's a, I was talking about that yesterday. I don't know. I guess I'm gonna have to learn two teams' walk up song. Yeah. Um. And kind of what they do. I'm hoping they don't give me their things to do because if it doesn't fit what I like to do, I'm hoping like I'm hoping they don't come up with a bunch of classic rock and we like this and that, that, because that's really not what we do now. Obviously, if they do, that's what I have to do. But I'm hoping they'll kind of just like give me their plate, and their walk up songs. And I can kind of just do what what it is that I do. I mean, other than their scoring songs. But I mean, it's actually put a lot more work on my plate. And also, I have to get together everything that I do and give it to my boss to send down there. So that's, that's including all my mixes, walk up tracks, my bumps, everything I have to put together to send to Texas to give to somebody who, I mean, I don't know who it is, but even if they're even going to do what we instruct them to, to kind of do with it, you know what I mean? Yeah. But I really feel, I really feel in my heart of hearts, 
I'm going to Texas somehow, some kind of way. I'm, I, I really feel that I'm doing it. I'm kind of believing it. Everybody's telling me, nah, you're not a student. I'm like, I really believe I'm going to Texas, though. Yeah. I really think I'm going to Texas. And then let's yeah. let's quickly talk about the new st- uh, system because um, in the 2000s, I've been to a game at Wrigley, and they had like a 1950s era, you know, right. green and red wire jammed into like a bullhorn right, system. Right, right. And it sounds like garbage, right. you know? Right, um, right. And, and, and let's also say this, too. Dodger Stadium is the third oldest ballpark in Major League Baseball. Right. And it is right. as modern, as as nice. As, you go to Wrigley, right. you're like, eh, you know, it's it's right. it's classic. But you don't go, God, right. it's a nice place. And Fenway, same thing. It's not – it's a different kind of charm. But L.A.'s, man, it's, it is a nice – you cannot go to a better stadium. It's so nice there. Right. Right. Talk about that acoustic sound system they gave you to work with this year, though, and how has it been test driving it? And, and uh, are you going to make changes before the All Star game? And do you get to make changes? I, I, actually, it's funny because the NAM that we both attended. Yeah, that's when I that's when I went up and and then uh, got with the um, acoustics people, and it's funny they gave me their total input. Like I'm like the main person who plays out of it they gave me the breakdown show me how they work and everything and to have the input then from then was like um uh, it's kind of surreal and then they actually called me um the first week of or maybe the second homestand and asked me how i liked it and if there was any changes i wanted i was like nah it's great and they actually said well look can we take your tweets and repost them because we really want to um use your expertise and in, in the in, in the tweets to kind of promote it. I said, sure. So I mean that stadium, that that sound system like rumbles. And it's funny to watch all the other players come in um during pregame and kind of point to it. And even Matt, when Matt came in, Matt came in with the Rockies and then he actually walked out there to to the system kind of like looking up and then he was pointing to different players to tell them like what has changed. So even Matt has recognized the difference. We do this we do at least once one night a game we'll we'll um we'll show um the warm-up the pitcher warming up and then i'll play music and we'll watch the screen rattle like kind of like with the bass that's how that's how crazy it is because it moves the camera that we're using for that so it's like that's the kind of a thing we kind of do to kind of show you uh what we're working with you know and we're not even we're not even you we're not even i'm not even pumped up all the way because um the formula people don't know is like you don't really a sound system can't really do its job unless people are in the stands to kind of absorb it and kind of like even make it what it is. So we're on like three quarters power because we can't even turn it up because there's no fans in the stands. That state that that sound system is built for fifty six thousand people to be in there. Yeah. So we not even we're not even halfway touching what it can do yet, and wow. it's rumbling. Yeah. That's crazy. Yeah, and I'm hoping yeah. that we get a chance to, because we talked about trying to get them all together and do a thing at the stadium. And just with, when, right when we were trying to work on it, you know, COVID broke out and we weren't able yeah, to yeah, really yeah. go forward with it. Yeah. But, I mean, it's just such a neat uh, uh, thing to have this this fantastic stadium. And, and next year you're going to have the All-Star game and all of that. Yeah. Do you yeah. get to be the DJ for the All-Star game or will they push you aside for some other kind of production element? Um, that's another thing. Um, so – um, DJ Irie, who normally does it, who gets the spotlight. So that's the difference. Management was also pushing for me to be the DJ because uh, they're like, look, we don't need DJ Irie. We have our own, like, like DJ. But now, and not be it for me to step on. Of course. Like, I'll, I'll never kick a, um, a DJ's gig, especially something like that, like, out of the hand. I would be more than happy to open for Irie. You know yeah. what I mean? Um, but like my our management believes in me so much, they're telling the MLB, like, no, we have our own DJ. We don't need, you know what I mean? Like I or anybody else for this is our this is our platform. We're LA. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like those other cities obviously need to bring in an IRE because they don't have DJs that can sustain it. They can say, Well, I got a DJ, this person, this, you know what I mean? So I've kind of like made my name for self. Even though my name is only LA, but my track record speaks for itself, my social media speaks for itself, my accolades speak, you know, yeah. for themselves. So yeah. If they did a little bit of homework, they could see that I could carry whatever it is I need to do. And I'm sure the players would be like, no, just let DJ Severe do it. We don't need, we don't want to, this is our stadium and yeah. he has our sound yeah. and it should sound like us. No one, I believe for me, no one, I should never go to anyone else's stadium and upstage them. You know what I mean? Yep. I should just be a part of it. And I, I believe that vice versa. Whatever your sound is, I just want to learn from you and be a 
like a like a like a part of it. You know what I mean? Um, there are some people who I would like, who I would love if the like if the Phillies came to town and Jazzy Jeff was here. I would love for Jazzy Jeff to come in and do some things. You know, I would love for some notable DJs from the places that they are from to come in and do stuff like along with me, like a DJ All Star. I, I get it. I get what you're saying. You know, like an All Star of DJs. Right. I gotcha. Yeah. 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 Um, so here's the funny thing about the Dodgers, and I know you'll appreciate this. You know Mike Brito. So Mike Brito is the guy for the Dodgers, for the audience, who he goes out and he finds these incredible uh, Mexican uh, players. You know, Fernando Valenzuela is like right. the first one. And so he's got he's got two World Series rings, 81 and 88. And I swear to God, this is true. Right. He walks around like this because he's got two rings right. on his hand, and he absolutely lets that shit hang heavy. Are you going right. to follow the Brito model when you get your ring? Are you going to be like, oh, this arm's a little heavier than the <laughs> other one? And are you going to wear it every day? You know, it's funny because um, <laughs> I have – where's my ring at? I, until I get the World Series ring. Uh-huh. Okay, here's what everybody does. As soon as we hit playoffs, everybody breaks out their, their ring. Um, where's my ring? Everybody breaks out their, their, their ring. Yeah. And that's when people start, you know, I mean, kind of like flaunting them around. But like you said, you're right. Brito, he has two things with him all the time. All the it's time. his cigars all the time and his ring. Um, let's see. I have mine. So here's mine that I keep in my bag Yeah. for 2017. Nice. Um, and we'll break them out. We'll break them out when playoffs hit. But ours are so bittersweet because they're only National League Championship yeah. rings. You know what I mean? Although them being, like, nice. And then I think it's just all bittersweet until we finally get the that championship. Now, I can imagine that we'll be so fulfilled that everybody will just be wearing them, like, all the time. So we everybody's trying to do features where they figure out, okay, well, of course, this playoff kind of gets you amped up. And so we'll start wearing them and, like, like, like walking around. And then I guess Mike Brito can do that because those are actually championship yeah. rings. I don't see anybody else doing that. I've checked out Oral's hands. I've checked out Tommy's hands. He, Mike Brito's the only person that does that. But like I said, once the next week hits and we get the LDS, people will start probably wearing them a little more. I think they'll probably wait till we get up a little bit before they start rocking them a little bit to kind of for some confidence. Because if you come out day one walking around like this and it's like like you know i mean flossing everybody it doesn't mean people can say it doesn't mean nothing until you cross the finish line so yeah yeah, um but i can't wait to hopefully we get it and then it means something you know what i mean but until then it just stays in my bag and i just keep it in my bag well and as you know the playoffs they don't care about how good you are it's about the ball hitting third base bag it's you know it's any crazy thing it's Austin Barnes having a three right. home run game. Right. You're like, how that happened? Like these crazy things right. happen, you know. And I've, right. like you, I've watched the Dodgers right. for a long time, and you, you just you have championship moments, and a lot of times it's just let's see what happens, and and then it happens, and it's just right. out of your hands, you know. A hell of a team, though. Hey, anything you right. want to say in closing? I mean, I've had you for an hour. I want to give you a chance to just say whatever it is that you want to say or ask. No, I mean, just, just um, you know what I mean? We're in crazy times. Just um, um, take the time to uh, com- communicate with your friends. Let's try to bring each other, like, together. Um, I've done a lot since COVID hit with trying to do my mixes and bring people together, um, heal some of the divisiveness, and just have, like, you know what I mean, like, common talks and see people's sides. There's a lot going on. And I don't think there's enough good music out there to heal it because nobody's making that much good music in order for people to lean on. So I'm trying to bring back when I find some stuff that makes me feel empowered and feel uplifted to try to do my part music wise. And anybody, if anybody ever needs to feel good, you can chime in, type in on any of my lives on my Instagrams and different things that I'm doing. And I will try to, I try to, I try to, I try to have more than just playing music. I try to have themes. I try to like um, speak to, the times and it's kind of like bring people together with music because that's what I feel like I can do. Same thing I try to do with this when people come to the stadium, even though it's just a limited amount at the stadium. I'm trying to do it for our players. I'm trying to do it for people that are telling me thanks, you know what I mean, on Twitter for doing this. And then I'm, so I'm trying to give back wherever yeah. I can, even with my with my giveaways and my 
like foundation. I'm just trying to give away and, and just do give back for everybody, you know. And I think that we need more of that. If everybody started doing that, we could heal faster. You know? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Because it turns out we're all in this together. And whatever this is that we're working on, whatever, because there's a lot of things, like you said, uh, we need each other. To, to really heal things, and right. go forward and, and yeah it's it's important and music is truly a, a big big part of that I love it I love that we uh, got a chance to do this and uh, I love that you're you're talking about the COVID thing because it's just so easy to get lost and scared but here you guys are providing a valuable service and I mean for right. the most part I would have to say the major leagues have done pretty good I mean there's been a couple of bumps in the road but for all of the hundreds of people that were trying to get this done they, they've done all right you know so cool man i appreciate you coming on everybody definitely check out dj severe's lives uh he's not kidding there's yacht rock there's uh gospel there's every everything you just you can always find a theme type in your message he will say what up back to you i promise i love dj severe's stuff man it's great 